I'm about to study the incorruptible, inerrant Word of God. I open my heart to God's message. I humble my mind to His wisdom, and I rest my hopes on His grace. I will accept His rebukes with repentance, rejoice in His truth by faith, and trust in His promises that can never fail. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I can change what it says I can change as I trust in His grace and Spirit. I covenant with God that I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to grow, and I'm ready to change as I hide His Word in my heart and honor Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. By the way, I forgot to do it before they left the stage, but why don't you say thank you to the worship team for all they've done. They did a beautiful job in leading us into the presence of the Lord this morning. All right, uh, you may be seated. Children may dismiss themselves out and the discipleship class as well. Last week, we began a two-part message called Kingdom Mass, and we're in part two this morning. And last week, as you will remember, in fact, as the... the uh, the picture of our, our message would remind you, we were talking about the feeding of the 5,000 and how Jesus taught the disciples to do kingdom math. In other words, to plug God into the equation of life. Because when you plug God into the equation of your life, everything changes because God is infinite. His power, his wisdom, his love, his mercy, his grace has no limits, and he has offered that to us. This morning, we're going to continue with the theme of kingdom mass, but we're going to go back into the Old Testament. And if you do have uh, your Bible with you, either on your, your phone or on your, your tablet, or uh, if, you, if you're old-fashioned like me, I still bring my, my Bible. It's sitting right there, but I use my iPad mostly. But, <clears throat> but nonetheless, if you got it, you may want to turn to Exodus chapter 3 and 4 and just kind of keep that open and look at that because we're going to be, I, though I won't read to that passage this morning, we're going to be talking a lot about that passage and I'll put up a lot of scripture verses from that passage. And so the title of the message this morning is Kingdom Math Part 2 and the subtitle would be What is in Your Hand? What is in Your Hand? Remember, that Jesus made them before he fed the nearly 25,000 people. Remember, they only counted the guys, so there was probably about 20 to 25,000 people there. That before he made them, he fed those people, he made them go and look and see what they had. What do you have on hand? They said, we don't know. He said, go and see. And then you remember how the story unfolds. So this morning, we're going to see that God, once again, is going to teach this principle about what is in your hand. Moses lived 120 years before he died outside the promised land, before Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land. D.O. Moody made an interesting observation about the life of Moses. And I've quoted this before, but I think it's a very good observation. He said, Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody. Then he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert realizing he was nobody. Finally, he spent the last 40 years of his life learning what God can do with a nobody. Now, that's pretty good insight. And so, once again, Moody kind of rings the bell there. In Exodus chapters 3 and 4, it is written, there is written there for us one of the most amazing interchanges between God and a man in all the history of the world. It's just stunning if you pay attention to it. In fact, if you don't read the Bible awake, you may not be as amazed as you should be. You should just be shocked at chapters 3 and 4 of Exodus and the interchange that happens between God and Moses. Now, you remember that Moses is tending sheep. He's been doing that for 40 years after he's run from Pharaoh and, uh, and failed as a rescuer of Israel. And you remember that he sees on the mountainside a bush burning, and it just keeps burning and burning and burning, and it's never consumed. And Moses says, this is an unusual sight. I need to go see this. So he climbs the mountain up to a certain point, wherever that bush was, and he's, as he gets near to it, suddenly he finds himself in the presence of God. God speaks from this bush. He's used this bush to get Moses' attention. 
And God says to him, Moses, take off your shoes. Where you're standing is holy ground. Wherever God is, is holy ground because he's a holy God. And Moses, take off your shoes. Get on your knees. This is holy ground. And so you remember then a conversation begins. God begins to tell Moses, look, I've heard the cry of my people Israel. They've been enslaved in Egypt, and I have decided to intervene. I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to bring them out with a mighty hand. And I am appointing you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And you go and tell him everything I tell you to say. And then you're going to lead out a great exodus from Egypt to the promised land because I'm going to give them the land I promised their father Abraham. Well, interestingly enough, after God finishes sharing with Moses what he has called him to do, that Moses comes up with more excuses than a kid at bedtime. I mean, he just, uh, and I mean, he multiplies them here amazingly. Look at some of his excuses in verses 3 through 11. He says this, he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out? Then in verse 13, if they question me about you, God, what shall I tell them? Verse chapter 4, 1. What if they do not believe me or listen to me? And then in verse 10, oh Lord, I've never been eloquent. I'm slow at speech and tongue. And then finally, 4, 13, please send someone else. You ever said that to God? Don't give me your saintly face. Okay, I know we've all said it at times. <laughs> Lord, just, just, you know, call somebody else, not me. This just doesn't fit my job description, you know? It's not really how I'm made. It is amazing that only 10 chapters later, we see a very different Moses standing at the Red Sea with the mightiest army on the face of the earth, bearing down on him and the children of Israel, and he is so completely different from how we find him in chapters 3 and 4. In fact, listen to this Moses in 14, 13 through, 13 through 14. He says, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. That's the key statement right there. The Lord will bring this deliverance. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. Notice again, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Wow, those are powerful words. What a different Moses this is from the one we just read about. He is a Moses now with a little, who's a little older, a little wiser, and more experienced. He is a Moses with a little bit of history in doing things God's way. And here is the first principle, and we'll be unpacking this principle all through the message, but here's the first principle for us that comes out of this story. God needs and uses men and women who have ceased to trust their own wisdom, power, and ability. That's the people God needs, and that's the people God uses. If you think you're the cat's meow and you can do it all on your own and that you've got all the talent in the world or whatever— then you probably are in for some big failures in your life. Now, this first principle, though, is a big requirement, and it's a hard one. Our wisdom, power, and abilities are inadequate because we haven't inherited the dying nature and the corrupt nature of Adam and Eve. But it's this corruption this sinful, dying nature that infects us with this false belief of our own sufficiency, our own self-sufficiency. So we find it hard to turn loose of this idea, I can do it myself, or that self is at the center. And we're often blind and hard-headed about being able to realize this truth concerning our inadequacies, for sin has made us self-centered and self-absorbed. We will see that Moses, in his life, will have to fail in a big way before he can ultimately embrace the truth of his inadequacies and meet this qualification of being someone who ceases to trust his own abilities. And so often it is with us as well. Second, there's a corollary to this first principle, and it's a second principle, and is this. God needs men and women who have replaced trust in themselves 
with trust in God in his wisdom, power, and ability. Do you see the difference? Instead of trusting my wisdom, power, and ability, I trust God's wisdom, power, and ability. And this is the difference we're going to see between the Moses of Exodus 3 and 4 and the Moses of chapter 14 and on and forward. But it is not, as we're going to see where we are now, Moses has not yet become that person that we will see in Exodus 14. In Exodus 3 and 4, there seems to be a great distance between these two. There's a lot of character difference. And Moses had to learn the hard way another very important principle. And that principle is this. Nothing will keep you from winning in life like confining your resources to your own abilities. If you are confining everything to your own abilities, you may accomplish some good things. You may accomplish things that the world thinks is great, but you will accomplish basically nothing of value and nothing of real significance unless you have God on board, unless you are working with him and allowing him to work through you. So we, will, we need to realize that we limit ourselves to small potatoes and we're trying to just do it on our own. Self cannot do the great things God is calling us to do. He's calling us to kingdom. Uh, he's calling us to kingdom involvement. And that kingdom is bigger. It spreads out into eternity and over a whole new creation. We can't fathom it. And this fact, the fact that God is calling us to do things that we can't do on our own, has high centered many in fear and keeps them from ever getting started in attempting to do the things that God has called us to do. This is the state of mind we find Moses in in Exodus chapters 3 and 4. God is calling, but Moses is basically doing this. He's trying to plug his ears. God is talking about what he's going to do, and Moses keeps talking about what Moses can't do. They're kind of talking past each other. Moses is trapped inside of an inadequate paradigm of how to live. Now you see, paradigm, paradigm. Well, paradigm is kind of a way of seeing life. It's kind of a worldview sometimes. It's a way of looking at things. Paradigms are very valuable. They help us to focus in on things, but they can also be very limiting when our paradigm is too small or it's focused in the wrong place. So, for example, the scientific paradigm is very valuable for doing science. However, there are things that are not within the scientific paradigm, and if you think that's all there is, then, of course, you're going to miss a whole lot of reality. And a lot of people are doing that today because science can only answer certain questions, and there's a lot of huge questions that are beyond its ability to even touch. So a paradigm is an important part of life, but... When God calls him to something clearly too big for him to do, he panics and tries to buy out because his paradigm is an inadequate paradigm. How did Moses end up being so fearful? How did he end up being so unwilling to listen to God's call? He didn't start out that way. What we need to realize is that we are finding Moses in the second of two phases of an inadequate paradigm of life. So what is this inadequate paradigm? Well, let's put it up. The inadequate paradigm is self. The inadequate paradigm is the favorite word of our culture, me. Me, 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 I, I, I. It's all about me. It's all about what I can do. I can do anything I can dream. I can do anything I can conceive. It's me, 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 me. The issue in this inadequate paradigm is misplaced faith. And the results, it results in failure. So there are two phases to this inadequate paradigm, and we find Moses early on in the first of these phases, and we find how he responds in this inadequate paradigm concerning himself. First of all, it's what we call the inexperienced response. The inexperienced response. First, he overestimates himself. We do that too sometimes. We overestimate ourselves. Moses in Exodus chapter 2, and I'm not going to tell the whole story, but you'll remember he ends up being raised in Pharaoh's household. He's given the best education in all of Egypt. He's a prince of, of Egypt. 
but he makes an incredible decision. He decides that he's going to reject being a son of Pharaoh or an heir to Pharaoh in any sense, and he's going to identify with his people, the people of Israel who are enslaved, but he knows carry the promise of the Messiah that will change the world. In fact, Hebrews tells us that Moses gave up the pleasures of sin for a season because he wanted instead to embrace the promise of Messiah. It says Christ in most of your Bibles, but, they would, but Moses would have known that as Messiah. Messiah, of course, they mean the same thing, but nonetheless, that was the term that had been close to him. And so for the sake of this seed of Abraham that was going to change everything and redeem the world, Moses said, I'm turning my back on Egypt and I'm going to identify with my people. Now, that's noble and that is incredible. However, he immediately elected himself as the designated deliverer. He just did a little calculation. He said, well, number one, God got me into Pharaoh's house. He got me the best education in Egypt. He got me, you know, he set me up with power and authority and ability. I guess God intends for me to be the deliverer. So I got a plan. I'll go out and start trying to get the Israelites to listen to me. And we'll see if we can get something taken care of here. Well, you remember the story. He sees an Egyptian slave master beating an Israelite and... He intervenes and ultimately ends up killing the slave master. He needs to cover it up, so he hides the man's body in the sand and goes back to the palace. The next day, he comes out among the Israelites. He sees two Israelites fighting with each other, and he intervenes and says, Hey, you two, don't you understand? You're part of the same family. You shouldn't be fighting with each other. And the man that was in the wrong, wanting to justify himself, of course, said, Well, who do you think you are? Who made you ruler over us? Are you going to kill me like you did that Egyptian yesterday? And suddenly, Moses realized that his murder has become broadcast. It's known. It's going to reach Pharaoh's ears. His face is going to be on wanted posters all over Egypt, and he runs for his life. And so he ends up going to Midian and ends up not leading the children of Israel out of bondage. He's 40 years of age when this happens. Instead, for 40 years, he leads nothing but sheep. So he's exiled from his own people. When we try to do things on our own, we often will fail. And sometimes we don't realize how bad we're doing. You know, it's really bad when you don't know how bad you're doing. When you think you're doing better than you really are. In fact, it reminds me of a funny story. Uh, Hank and Jed were a couple of country boys, and they read in the local paper that a wildlife firm was giving $100 for every wolf that was captured and delivered alive to them for study. They decided this was a great opportunity to make some money. So they were good hunters and good trappers, and so they just loaded up their camping gear, and they went off into the mountains looking for wolves. On the second night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, Hank wakes up, and he hears a lot of snarling and everything going on outside the tent. So he opens the tent flat, and he looks out, and he realizes they're surrounded by a, by a wolf pack of about 50 snarling wolves all around their tent. And he closes the tent flap and goes, Jed, wake up. We're rich. <clears throat> Sometimes we don't know how bad we're doing. <laughs> we need to know the difference between when the wolves have us and we have the wolves. And when we try to do it without God, the wolves usually win. Moses would not be the last to be careless about making sure God is with you before you jump into a huge undertaking. You may recall there's another story. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. You know the story. The story of, of Samson. We usually talk about Samson and Delilah because she was his downfall. But remember, Samson had been entered into from birth into a covenant with Yahweh, the God of Israel, and that if he would live as a Nazarite and never cut his hair, that God's Spirit would remain on him and make him so physically mighty and powerful that no one could conquer him. He could literally kill hundreds of men at a time. 
because he was such an incredible warrior and had so much supernatural strength on him by the Spirit of God. And it was because of his covenant with God. But you remember, he began to play fast and loose. He had an eye for the ladies, even the ones that were supposed to be off limits. And he kept messing around. And you remember that he ends up with Delilah and, and she's being paid by the Philistines to try to figure out what's the source of his power. And he tricks her several times. But it's amazing how gullible he is. Eventually, this lady gets to him and he shares with her the secret of his covenant with God and that the hair is the symbol of his faithfulness to God. And so she gets him to go to sleep in her with his head in her lap and then she calls in a barber and he shaves his head. And remember, all of his hair is gone. And then here's what she says. The event unfolds like this. She said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Those are tragic words. He ended up with his eyes blinded out. He ended up pushing a grinding grain like a donkey. He ended up being a blind slave because he did not know the Spirit of the Lord had left him because he was unfaithful to his God and to his covenant. And you know, when we try to do things on our own without being faithful to God, we're going to end up in trouble. Samson had faith, but with an inadequate foundation. His faith was in, was in himself and his own abilities, not in God. Next comes phase two of the inadequate paradigm. We move from the inexperienced response, which we see in Moses where he overestimated himself, to the intimidated response. We often go to the other extreme. We start saying things like, I can't do anything. I quit. Now, this is wounded faith and wounded pride. I, I, the problem here is still a focus on self. Dependence on self. This is the opposite response to the same problem. I'm still looking at me, still looking, saying I, I'm the source, and then I decide, well, I've learned my lesson. I can't do anything. So Moses got this point, got to this point, and this is where we find him in Exodus 3 and 4. He has learned half of his lesson, but he mistakes it for the whole lesson. And God comes to make it clear to him, no. You've only got half the lesson, but Moses won't turn loose of it. He thinks it's the whole thing. He's learned of his weakness and inadequacy in his independence, but he has not yet become aware of the strength and the adequacy he can have when he learns to depend upon God. He doesn't understand that yet. So let's look at how Moses responds and how God is trying to deal with him. Moses basically says, I'm inferior. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out? I'm a nobody. Why would you send me? Now, that, that's a little ironic because Moses had been a prince of Israel. Of course, in one sense, he was also a wanted man. So, but he was someone who had been significant. But nonetheless, he's, he's taking this row. He says, I'm a nobody now. I've done nothing but lead sheep for 40 years. Why would anybody listen to me? I'm inferior. And he's looking at things merely as humans do. Moses looked at past failures and learned the wrong lesson. He basically says, no way, I don't do good with Pharaohs anymore. I tried that, didn't work. So the application for us might be, how about you and me? Learn any wrong lessons from past failures? Come to any generalizations in your mind and heart? Like, uh, you can't trust anyone, or you can't trust men, or you can't trust women, or God never blesses me, he only blesses other people. I can't start a new business, I'd never succeed at anything. I will never get married again because I know it only leads to pain. I will never marry, period, because, fill in the blank. 
I don't have time to answer God's call. I don't know how. It makes me too uncomfortable. I could never remember all the scriptures I would need to share the gospel with someone. I would be too scared. I can't minister or lead because I'm not qualified, etc., etc., etc. And often, there's this sense of, I can't do it, inadequacy. In a sense, behind all the excuses Moses comes up with is a loud internal voice declaring, my past invalidates me. I failed. I failed, so I'm not qualified. Anybody ever fail? Everybody's head should be shaking. Yes, not this way, this way. Because if you're shaking it this way, come see me. I've got some help for you, okay? (laughs) We've all failed. But aren't you glad for the mercy and the grace of God? And aren't you glad that he can make us overcomers by his spirit? So Moses is saying, my past invalidates me. So I have a question for you. Ever hear those internal voices? Do they ever tell you that you're, you, you'll never be able to do anything because of what happened in your past? You failed. You were so sinful. God will never use you. On and on and on and on it goes. Well, you need to understand That's just not your self-talk. That's the enemy whispering in your ear. Next, Moses comes up with the rest of his list of excuses. I don't have any credentials. (laughs) Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then how shall I tell them? In other words, they're not going to listen to me. I don't have any credentials. I don't have any letters of recommendation from anybody. Why would they listen to anything I tell them? And then he comes up with, I don't have any power. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me? The Lord and say, the Lord did not appear to you. I don't have any power to change their mind. I, I, I just, I can't convince them. And then when God answers these, he he finally comes up, I can't speak. (laughs) Moses said to the Lord, Oh Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Isn't that interesting? Because some of the most profound things that have ever been said to a crowd of people in the world was said by Moses ultimately, because God would teach him how to speak. But it would start out that he would have to have a crutch. Of course, he finally just gets serious, with, you know, honest with God and says, I'm really scared. I'm really scared. But Moses said, oh, Lord, just please see someone else to do it. You ever said that to God? God, I, I, I can't do that. I, you know, those five-year-olds in that class, they scare me to death. I, I can't teach that class. I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, I, I can't share the gospel with my neighbor. I, I, it, you know, I'd be too afraid. I wouldn't know what to say. You know, this interchange has been repeated time and again between God and his children. So many of us have said these things to God in one form or another. God, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. The big problem is the word I, 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 I. In fact, I will say to you as a pastor for (laughs) decades, that, and having trained pastors for many years and talking with them, that this conversation goes on between pastors and some of their laymen. Many laymen are quick to step up and become a part of the kingdom and, and, and solutions and ministry of, that the church is trying to carry on. Others are like, no, I can't, I can't, I can't, because they have their eyes on themselves. Moses has moved from the inexperienced paradigm response of pride to the intimidated response of wounded pride. But God wants to get Moses completely out of this inadequate paradigm. And in either one of these phases, the inexperienced response where you overestimate yourself and the intimidated response where you basically say, I can't do anything. He said, this paradigm is useless. I want you to give it up altogether. I'm going to give you a 
more realistic and accurate and truthful paradigm. He wants Moses to move to the incredible paradigm, which is God. Put God into the equation of your life. The issue is a magnificent fact, and that fact will result in miracles. What is that magnificent fact? Well, it's the reality of God with you. Do you realize that at the center of the gospel of Jesus Christ, jumping forward a few thousand years, is the same magnificent fact that God is with us? Not only is he with us, he is in us and living through us. I was reading Colossians this week, and I always love it when I get to that place where Paul is in the first chapter is talking about how God called him to make known among the nations, the Gentiles and everyone, the glorious mystery of the gospel. And he says that mystery is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what the gospel makes possible by our sins being forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, by the power of his resurrection that conquers death, hell, and the grave, and breaking our chains so that we can go free, we can have the Holy Spirit of Christ living in us and through us, and we have the hope of glory and the hope of success even in this life. That's the gospel. Thank you, Andrew. That's the gospel. That's what it's all about. And Moses is needing to learn this same thing that God is with you. That's the reality. It is here that God wants to teach Moses some kingdom math. You plus God equals more than us. We learned that last week, and we're going to see that in just a moment. God's message to Moses is basically this. Not you, me. You think you're going to go and set the life free? You tried that once. How'd that work out for you? Not so good. He ended up leading sheep. Later on, I think the sheep would have looked pretty good to him as rebellious as the Israelites were. But the point is, is that God says, no, Moses, you're not going to do this. I'm going to do this. You go, I'll put words in your mouth. You go, I'll tell you what to say. You go, I'll tell you what to say, and then I'll do it. Do you realize Moses never raised a sword? Moses never fought a battle when he was in Egypt, that the Israelites never fought a battle, that God did all the fighting. It was all supernatural. And they walked out with a mighty, mighty powerful arm. This is the paradigm of dependence and strength. All through this conversation with God, Moses keeps bringing up his lack of significance, his lack of power, his lack of credentials, his lack of ability. God keeps drawing Moses back to a great truth. It does not matter about you, Moses. I am. He gives Moses and shares with Moses his great name. I am that I am. And it sounds a lot like the, the uh, Hebrew verb, which means not only to be, but to cause to be. And then from this, we think we get the, something that sounds like Yahweh, the essential name of God. And God says, I am, and I am with you, and I am is here. God keeps countering Moses' misfocus. Moses says, who am I? And God says, I will be with you. Moses says, I have no credentials. And, and God is basically saying, it's my credentials. You'll be working under Moses. I'm doing this, not you. I have no power to back me up. But God says, I have no lack of power. I'm the creator of all the ends of the earth. Moses says, I can't speak. <laughs> and the Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives his sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. And then Moses gets, as I said, really honest with God and just finally says, I'm scared. I'm scared. And God says, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Have you ever had a conversation where you made God angry? Moses made God angry. Then God's anger burned against Moses. And he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. 
He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. He said, you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. Notice God didn't give up on Moses speaking. He says, I will help both of you speak. But he's given Moses a crutch for right now. I will speak to the people for you. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. This is an amazing passage where God sets up a chain of authority between Moses and Aaron. Now, how did Moses know that God's anger burned against him? Uh, we really don't know. We're not told, but we're told that it happened. Now, remember, he's at a burning bush. Uh, I could imagine that maybe suddenly God is so angry with Moses that the bush flames up twice as high and the flames come out twice as far and Moses has to back up like God is saying, I'm angry with you, Moses. You need to start listening instead of making excuses. God is driving home the point to Moses, not you, me, not you, me. Get your eyes on me, Moses. Oh, how we need to see this point. Much of God's work goes undone because those God is calling are excusing themselves for all kinds of reasons which have to do with their focus on themselves. We have too much of self in the way, too much of me in the way. We focus on ourselves and, we, and we're either stuck in the, uh, in the inexperienced paradigm or the inadequate paradigm and, and, it, our, and the uh, intimidated paradigm. We're just stuck on ourselves. And here's a principle. Until we get our eyes off ourselves and on God, we will never be able to do the work of God. You can't do the work of God by human strength. You can't do the work of God by human ingenuity and creativity, no matter how gifted you may be, or how smart you may be, or how intelligent you may be. It will not work because God is calling you to something supernatural, and you can't accomplish it with natural means. We've got to get our eyes off ourselves and get them on God. In a sense, the burning bush was a great big stop sign in Moses' life. Do you realize that? He was headed for continued mediocrity, and the world would never have heard of him, and his life would have been a totally unknown reality. We would never have heard of Moses. But instead, God took Moses... And at this stop sign, redirected his life and changed the world forever. He became one of the greatest men in the history of the world. God put a flaming halt in Moses' path and said, in effect, stop. I have a new direction for your life. Moses wasn't interested, but God kept insisting. And I guess this raises a question for you and me. How have you or how are you now? responding to God's call to redirect your life. God may be calling you at this very moment to redirect your life, saying, you need to get your eyes more off yourself and more on me. You need to believe I can do through you what you never believed I could do through you. This may be a burning bush moment. You see, the key is to get us to take a step of faith and get started so God can manifest himself. And that will start changing us into men and women who expect God to show up when we are doing his work, and that becomes a life of miracles. I hear people constantly complaining, we don't see enough miracles. We don't see enough of God doing stuff. Well, I got news for you. Until we get out there and risk something for God, there's no reason for him to show up. You don't need a miracle when you're just sitting on your couch. We have to by faith, step out. And people who step out and risk things for God because God has called them to be involved in, king, in the key work of the kingdom, they're going to see a life where God moves and they're going to see supernatural things. They're going to see lives change. They're going to see bodies healed. They're going to see families put back together. They're going to see miracles. So, getting Moses started was the key. Now, how did God do that? Well, first, God promised his presence. 
will be with him. God said, I will be with you. I will be with you. Reminds me of the story of Pastor Sam Roberts. Pastor Sam was, uh, lived in Oklahoma City, pastoring in Oklahoma City, and he had, he had a brother who was an NFL uh, player, football player. He was, his brother was 6'7", 260 pounds at 5% body fat. That's a linebacker, brothers and sisters, and you don't want to get hit by him. That's a bowling ball <laughs> in a body. Uh, but nonetheless, he said uh, that he and his brother decided to go to a movie together. He said, he said they were close. Now, Sam says, he says, I, I'm not big like my brother. He says, I'm tall, but I'm, I'm the skinny basketball player type. You know, but my brother, he said, he's this massive muscular hulk. He said, we got there at the movie late, and we'd gotten our popcorn and our drinks, and said, they said we were kind of trying to hold them, and we're trying to scoot in between some people, and said, my brother's thighs are so big, they're like, you know, big logs, said he could hardly get through, and said he bumped a guy in front of us, and said the guy really seemed to get really irritated, and said, when we sat down, my brother sat directly behind him so the guy couldn't see him. But I said, I was sitting here. And said, he kept turning and glaring at me. And he kept, ah, you know, and grunting and like, ah, I can't believe you, know, you guys are so, you know. So he just kept glaring and said he wouldn't quit. Said he seemed to be trying to impress his girlfriend. And said he just, you know, was pulling the old, uh, I'm irritated with you. I can't believe you did that to me. And he said, my brother wasn't paying much attention. And he said, I was getting uncomfortable starting to look for an exit. Because this guy really seemed to be angry. And he said, all of a sudden, my brother saw what was going on. Said he leaned forward with his six, seven, 260 pound frame and shouted, Mister, have you got a problem? He said, the guy shrunk like a wilted violet and said, he said, I think I heard water trickling on the floor and he hadn't spilled his Coke. <laughs> But Pastor Sammy said, suddenly I just squared my shoulder and sat back in my seat and quit being worried. He said, because I remembered who I was with. Do you realize who you are with? God says to each of us, I will be with you. Remember what Jesus said right before we went back to heaven? I will be with you. The Greeks really should be translated. I'll be with you every single day until the end of the age. I, there won't be one second I won't be with you. I will not abandon you. I will never leave you. Do we realize who we're with? For the Christian who walks with God, here are some important principles of the incredible paradigm. And that incredible paradigm, of course, is God. God with us. First, it doesn't matter where you are if you know who you're with. You say, I'm in a dangerous place. Doesn't matter. You might have a guy angry and snarling at you, but if you know you're with the 260-pound linebacker, you're not going to be worried. Well, no matter where you walk in this world, no matter where God sends you, you're with him. And he's bigger than what's the matter. Always. Always. Do you remember who you're with? It doesn't matter about your past either because God has chosen to be with you now. You see, I, I don't know. I, I failed so bad in the past. I was so sinful. And I don't know. Yeah. Stop that. God forgave you. Do you believe in the power of the cross or not? Do you believe the blood of Jesus is adequate or not? Do you believe that Jesus is a Savior or not? Sometimes we blaspheme God with our poor mouthing. It doesn't matter about your past because God has chosen to be with you now. You see, Moses is trying to quit life. He's basically saying, let me coast in, Lord. I don't want to get back in the game and risk anything. I'm 80 years old and my rocking chair fits me just fine. And if you want to, you know, tag on to that and sign your name, maybe you're not 80 years old yet, but your rocking chair fits you fine. God's answer, in a sense, contains a principle for all of his servants. That principle could be stated like this. If you're not dead, you're not done. 
If you're not dead, you're not done. <laughs> so to get Moses started, God is going to teach him that when he has God, he needs nothing but what he already has. The key to getting going and, <laughs> and then allowing God to show up at every situation you face is to just get started with what you have. But if you don't do that, God can't show up until you go and face the situations. You must move in faith. So get going. And I know this is a little axiomatic and self-evident. The point is, is that you... Please. Sorry. You will never finish something you don't start. And that's a very important thing, even though it seems so obvious. So God is trying to do something new in Moses' life. And God wants to do something new in our lives. And he wants us to take the first step on the journey so that he can show up in our lives. God is with you, but you will not know it if you do nothing and risk nothing. And God makes himself known to you and visible to you by showing up in your need when you go in faith. If you don't go, God can't show up. Too many people say, I never see miracles. Well, risk something for God, and you might see one. I remember the disciples in the storm. They're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do, and they end up in the storm, and they can't make any headway, and they're in the middle of the lake, remember? And it's, they're soaked to the core and miserable, and suddenly something begins to happen. Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And you remember the story, and even Peter gets in on it a little bit, but when they get back in the boat, he calms the storm. But here is one of the most important moments in the disciples' whole life. They had been walking with Jesus for several months. They knew he was a great prophet. They knew he might be the Messiah, but they didn't understand that Messiah was God in the flesh, the creator of the universe who could control the whole creation. And suddenly Jesus puts them in a storm. They're probably complaining about it, but then Jesus shows up walking on the water and then gets in the boat and tells the storm to quit, and it quits, and suddenly their eyes are opened. And they realize, guys, we've been walking around with the creator of the universe all these months. We've been walking around with God himself in human form. And it says they fell on their knees and worshiped him. That storm was one of the greatest moments in their life because it opened the, their eyes to see reality like they'd never seen it before. Suddenly they realized who they were really with and who was really with them. The second thing, and we'll be closing, kind of moving toward the close with this, is God asked Moses, what is that in your hand? What is that in your hand? You know how the story goes, staff, you know, shepherd's staff, the serpent, grab the serpent, turns back to shepherd's staff. I'm going to go through the whole story. But last week, part, uh, part, in part one of this sermon on Kingdom Math, we saw that before Jesus would feed this massive crowd, he said to the disciples, you do it. And they said, we don't have anything. He said, well, go see what you got. They said, we don't know. He said, well, go see what you got. Well, you remember Andrew finally found a little boy's lunch, two fish and five loaves. And he said, this is what we got, but what's this among so many? It's so inadequate. And Jesus said, yeah, that's right, but give it to me. And then he taught them kingdom math as he multiplied it, fed the massive crowd, nearly 20 to 25,000 people, and then said, go out and take your baskets and fill them up with the leftovers. Not only was it enough, it was more than enough because they filled 12 baskets full. God is never, never too challenged. And so Jesus taught them some kingdom math. And that kingdom math is your resource plus God. More than enough. More than enough. In other words, whatever you have it in your hand, give it to God and he will make it more than enough. This is what God is teaching Moses. It is a kingdom math principle. I will use what you have is what God is saying. I will use what you have. God demands that Moses get started now with whatever he has. And what does he have? He has a shepherd's staff. 
Before it's all done, God will use that shepherd staff to change the history of the world. It's an old hardened wooden stick about two inches round, probably six or seven feet long. It's used for pushing sheep around. It's used for killing snakes. It's used for as a walking stick. It's just an old hardened piece of wood. And yet God says, what do you got in your hand? He goes, this, this shepherd staff, this stick, that's all I got. And then God begins to show him what he can do with that. Let me say something. Today, if you could prove you actually had found and had in your possession the very same staff that Moses used to strike the red the Nile River and turn it to blood, the very same staff that he held over the Red Sea and parted it, the very same staff that he struck a rock with and water came out of it in the desert, if you could prove that you had the authentic thing, how much would that be worth? <laughs> you could get billions for it. And it's just an old stick. But God took the ordinary and did the extraordinary. And that's what he wants to do with you. That's what he wants to do with each of us. And you know, if someone had the real staff of Moses and they said, wow, I've got real power now. I'm going to go part the Red Sea. And they you know, wave that staff over the Red Sea. Guess what would happen? Nothing. Because there is no power in that stick. There's no power in that staff. The power is in God. But God chose to use that as an instrument, and he chose to use Moses as an instrument, and he has chosen to use you as an instrument. The power is not in you. The power is God in you. And through you, got to get our, we've got to get our eyes off ourselves and get our eyes on him. So what is in your hand? Let me ask you a couple things. Say you're a good welder. You have welding ability. You say, that's, that's all I know how to do. Well, start a ministry to young <clears throat> men and women and, and help them learn a skill to get a job and to share Jesus' love with them while you're teaching them how to weld. Talk about Jesus while you're welding. Say, well, I, I know how to cook. Well, use your cooking, and many of you do that. I know you bless families when they're in need, or maybe you can start a cooking class for young girls who don't know how to cook, or young wives who don't know how to cook, maybe and make some husbands really happy. Uh, <laughs> but, the start, but share Jesus while you're doing it, you know, while you're stirring up, you know, the cake. Share Jesus. Maybe you, you like to run. We got a couple of guys like that, you know, Steve Corrett and James Groves. You know, they like to run. And if you like getting up at 4 a.m. and running a 5K, well, then invite those who like that kind of abuse and get together and run and then have breakfast and a Bible study before you go to work. What do you got in your hand? You say, I like gardening. Well, you know a lot about gardening. You like to talk about it. Well, form a life group around Gardening and share God's love with those who come. Pray for each other. Lift each other up. Encourage each other in the faith. Ask what is in your hand, then use what you have. I can go on and on. There's hundreds of gifts out here. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gifts. God can use every one of them. You say, but my gift's just an old stick. Yeah. Pay attention. What did God do with an old stick? He changed the history of the world in the hands of a man who said, okay, I'll get my eyes off myself and get my eyes on you. What if God could take your ordinary gift and change even one person's forever, one person's eternity? Would that be worth it? Yeah, that'd be worth your whole life. 
You see, I, I worked hard all my life and I only got one person saved. Well, praise God, because you just changed somebody's forever. And that's bigger than all the things the world has to offer. But likely, he'll give you more fruit than that. You say, well, I'm at a place in life I can do very little or nothing. Whatever it is you can do, give it to God. You say, I'm so feeble, all I can do is pray. Well, pray. Make a very long prayer list and be faithful to it. Pray because prayer changes the world. Conclusion. So is God calling you to a burning bush experience, maybe? They come in many forms. Is he saying, stop, I have a new direction for your life? If so, here are some action steps you need to take. Stop arguing with God and start listening and obeying. That's the first thing. It takes a step of faith. Next, start where you are at the intersection of the burning bush, whatever that bush looks like. Choose God's path forward. And then just realize you only have to use what you have. You don't have to wait on some big deposit of some kind of spiritual reality. You just need to use what you have. Do what you can. God will show up all along the way and miracles will happen. In other words, get started. You will never finish something you don't start. Lord said to Moses in the end, so now... Go. We need to learn to trust him and go. Today might be your burning bush moment with God. I want to close this service this morning with an opportunity for all God's people to say to God, God, I want to, at this moment, just renew my commitment to keep my eyes off myself and to get my eyes so, more, so fully on you that you can use me, that you can take, no matter how ordinary I feel or how inadequate I feel, help me to get my eyes off myself and realize that I can make a difference when you are making the difference through me. And you promised you would do that. And I will never know that promise until I step out in faith and actually need you to show up. But I'm going to step out of faith. And many of you are already living there. Maybe you'd like just to renew that this morning and say, Lord, help me to do it even more. Help me to trust you even more. Help me to have more faith, to step out and do greater things for you, to challenge more things if, as you call me to do it. Not to step out in self-sufficiency or step out in my own wisdom, but to stay in your word and listen carefully to your spirit and then do exactly what you call me to do. Give me eyes to see so I can respond and see miracles. Stand together with me. If you'd like to be a part of this closing prayer as we ask God to help us do that, I'm going to give you an opportunity just to come forward. Let's just come and say, God, would you take what I have, whatever it is, no matter how small, no matter maybe how great it is, I don't know, in men's eyes, in women's eyes, just give it to God and say, God, I'm yours. And I believe that you can take my life and do something extraordinary with the ordinary and i'm going to keep my eyes on you help me get my eyes on you some of you this morning may be struggling with a wound and you keep hearing that voice my past invalidates me come and give that to god and say that's a lie and lord help me to get free from that lie some of you have failed and you just think i, I could never do anything that's a lie you need to get free from that lie and come and realize that with God, all things are possible. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much that you make us part of your kingdom and you teach us how to live, adding you to the equation of our life. Kingdom math. Learning how to add things up with God at the center learning how to see everything through the lens of real reality. And now we see everything through the God who has revealed himself and our Messiah, the Lord Jesus. So I pray that you will open the eyes of our heart, 
Help us to trust you more so you can pour more grace on us and your spirit can work powerfully through us. And may there be miracles of grace in people's lives and in families and just all over this county and all over this state because your people, not only just in our church, but all God's followers, all Christ's followers everywhere, that they will give themselves to you without reservation that we'll quit being like a kid at bedtime making excuses, but instead just open up and say, here am I, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, and send me. Thank you for your promise that when we go, you will be ahead of us, you will be behind us, you will be around us, you will be beneath us, and you will be above us. We will not be able to escape your presence. And whatever we need, we will have. And we thank you in the powerful name of your glorious eternal Son, our victorious Lord and Savior, and our soon-coming King, whom we long for his appearing. In the name of our Lord Jesus Messiah, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.